Nehemiah. Um, last week I was at Edgware and uh, I was preaching there and my wife knew what I was preparing to speak. Obviously, we speak uh, during the week about this sometimes, not always. And uh, when she picked me up at the station, because I live down in Hastings, she said, you'll never, for, uh, you'll never think of what uh, they started to teach in our church. I go to Holy Trinity Hastings. And she said, they started a series on Nehemiah. And I thought, hmm, I wonder how many churches at the beginning of this year are starting a series on Nehemiah. Uh, I'm sure it's just not these two churches. Uh, and so maybe the Spirit of God is saying something in our nation that it's time that we really focused and considered very seriously the rebuilding of the walls of this nation. The spiritual walls that possibly have been broken down over the years. I would probably think since, since the First World War, there has been a decline of the spirituality in this nation. First World War, second by, followed by the Second World War, the loss of uh, over a million men from our nation, churches depleted, uh, new age, new thinking, new way of doing things, secularization. Maybe the walls of the kingdom of God in this nation have been broken down. And it's, it's people like me and you, ordinary people that God will give the job of building up the walls. Uh, we are caught up in a time when we're looking at uh, stars, important people, and we, we turn away from ourselves thinking we're nothing to, to look to the great and the famous. God doesn't do that. God takes every individual life and makes it vital to him. And we need to take our eyes sometimes off the rich and famous, be it the spiritually rich and famous, and say, God, what are you giving me to do? Because you'll use a million people to do a lot of small things to make one great big thing. So I'm going to talk to you about uh, Nehemiah. If we were to... Uh, look into the ancient books regarding Nehemiah, we'd see that the book of Nehemiah and Ezra were together. They were one book. And so if you do any homework on this subject or as you study it through uh, with whoever's preaching to you on this series, bear in mind that Ezra and Nehemiah are one book in the original and they need to be read together. So I made it, what I did, I went home and listened to this on tape, both the books taking them in and reading them together. Perhaps I need to give you a brief history of where we are because I'm the first of a series of, of six talks, I believe. So I'll use this one to lay a little bit of a foundation. It's not going to be a boring history lesson. Don't worry about that. I'll move through it very quickly, and I won't put all the detail in there, but enough for you to think, oh, this is where it's set. Although Nehemiah appears about halfway through the Old Testament, it is actually one of the last things that God did with the Old Testament people. It happened probably four or five hundred years before Christ came, and we know for a period of about 400 years, God said nothing between the Old and New Testament. So it's really one of the last things that God did with his people, the building up of the walls of the city. One of the children of Israel got to at this stage. They had divided, that, remember they were 12 tribes, and they had divided into two nations, a northern nation of 10 tribes and a southern nation of two tribes. The northern tribes were called Israel and the southern tribes were called Judah. Uh, they, they both were rebellious in their own way to God. They need the prophets of God to come and direct them all the time. But about 700 years before Christ came, we see that the northern ten tribes, the nation of Israel as it was called, were taken into captivity by the Assyrians. And because of their detachment, because of their rebellion, God actually divorced himself from them. Those are the words that he used. It was a difficult thing for him to do, but there was no way of regaining them again. They were lost forever. The southern two tribes, the, the nation of, of Judah, were 
more loving towards God, more repentant towards God, and God was forever trying to draw them to himself. Some years later, probably 100, 150 years later, this southern nation, the nation of Judah, was also taken into captivity uh, by Nebuchadnezzar, and then that went on to be the nation of Persia that held these people in Babylon in captivity. The prophet had made it clear that they would be in captivity for 70 years, and then God would start to deliver them from their captivity. And we know that a man called Zerubbabel was the first man that gathered the people together, approached the king and said, will you release our people so we can go back and rebuild Jerusalem? And so he went with about 50,000 of the Jewish people from Babylon and those areas and took them back for the rebuilding of the city of God. We know that he spent most of his effort rebuilding the temple of God. The walls and the buildings within the city were never rebuilt under Zerubbabel. And so the people felt insecure. They felt unsafe to go and live in the city. So the vast number of these 50,000 that returned, and there were other Jews that were there remaining, they weren't all taken into captivity. They, they were dispersed into the nations around. Nations were very small at that time. And they were assimilated into these nations. And they were losing the vision of God, the teaching of God, the worship of God. They were losing all these things as they took on the culture of these other nations that they found themselves living in and amongst. They also married the women of these nations. And so God was very concerned that his people were being diluted. And so his desire in the building up of Jerusalem... The, the restructuring of worship, the building up of the walls, the city of God, the people of God being gathered in again. He sent another man some years later, about 60 years after Zerubbabel had been there. And this was the man Ezra. And Ezra was a priest. And as a priest, his task was to gather the people and to teach them the things of God again to show them the law of God, to, to teach them the way that God wanted to gather them and worship them and look after them and care for them. And so Ezra went and he started to teach the people. Several years after this, about seven years, God spoke to this man called Nehemiah and said, Nehemiah, I have a job for you. I want you to go back and to build up the walls of the city of Jerusalem. That's it. That's the potted history. Not too in-depth, but enough for you to think, thank you. We know where it is now in our Bibles. We know where it is in history, and we know the context of which Nehemiah, this man, is called to go back to God. He's a kingdom builder. Sometimes we think, what is this Bible that's this particular passage written two and a half thousand years ago got anything to do with me today? How can it be relevant in my life? Do you know what we're busy doing? Building the walls of the city of the kingdom of God. We are doing exactly the same thing that Nehemiah did. Obviously, he's doing a very practical work. Ezra was doing a very spiritual work. And we have been spoken to by God. Again, it's time, church, to rebuild these walls. It's time to listen to hear what God is calling you to do and get involved in the process of building. Now, what I like about Nehemiah, when it's all said and done, God says something very simple to him. I want you to build some walls. That was simple. Now, he wasn't a builder. He was a cupbearer for the king because his dependence was on God. We know that the Zerubbabel said it's not by might or it's not by human strength or power, but by the Spirit of God that I do the things that you call me to do. And so Nehemiah, a cupbearer to the king, a confidant of the king, was given a job to build walls, to be a bricklayer, to do something very practical in his life. You know, sometimes I'm in amazement that I'm standing preaching the Word of God. 
As a young man, as a teenager at school, I couldn't string two words together. I stammered. Now, if you've ever stammered or know someone that stammered, it's just very embarrassing. It's a real strain. It's an awkward thing all the time. I remember I used to get on a, a bus uh, to get home from school, and I used to have to say a tuppenny half. Uh, you don't know what a tuppenny half is. A tuppenny thing is two pence. But because of my stammer and my thinking of what I had to say, do you think tuppenny half would come out of my mouth? It would never come out of my mouth. And so I used to be in trepidation for when the bus conductor would come. That's the day when they used to take the money and give you a ticket like this years and years ago. I would freeze. And of course, he would stare at me. And I couldn't say anything. It wouldn't come out of my mouth. The very words, tuppenny half, wouldn't come out. So I used to think of all other ways of saying it, or not thinking about the conductor coming at all, and just, just sort of spring it on him like it was terrible. And I remember being sent to a therapist to help me with all this. So the fact that I can stand before people today and preach with no hint of a stammer, thanks be to God. It is by His grace, it is by His power, and not by natural things. I also remember at school I wasn't a great student, and I never liked to read a book. I first read a book when I was 21 years of age. You said, Philip, how do you ever pass any exams? Well, I could read, I wasn't silly, but I would only read what I had to read. Sufficient to pass the exam, never beyond that, never read a, a, a novel, never read anything. And I remember at 21 years of age, I was traveling into town, and I had this overwhelming desire to read a book. And I think the first book I ever seriously read was James Bond. I forget which one it was, uh, as a student going into London. And just as I think of that, I'm thinking, God takes us, and it is not by our might or by our power that we do things for God. It is by the Spirit of God. Sometimes He takes our natural abilities, the way that we are, the personality that we are, and He flows His Spirit through it. But it has to be His Spirit that flows through your personality or completely new giftings altogether. And that's what God is doing. That's what He wants to do with each one of us, to use us to be instrumental in what he's doing. So it never came natural for Nehemiah to build a wall. I don't think he knew anything about building walls. That wasn't his job. We have no inclination that he was ever interested in that at all. The name of this first message in this series is Rebuilding Through a Promise. See, to move by faith with God God has to speak. Our faith is based on something that God, the person of God, says. And though he says a lot in his Bible, but really he has to speak from his word to us, and that word becomes living and active to us. Or he might speak by the Holy Spirit, or speak through a sermon, and God speaks to you, and he plants a word, a promise, or something in your heart that as you take it and, and take it on board and believe it is the word of God, it starts to produce in your life. We can't just think up anything and say, I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that. That's not faith. Faith has to be founded on what God has said. What might we gain by studying this ancient writing, two and a half thousand years old. What's the benefit for us today? Well, I don't know if you're interested in your family's history. I'm a little bit interested. I don't think I'll ever find out too much about it because we weren't rich and famous, so nobody knows anything. No one's recorded anything of our family. I can go back to my father and my grandfather and, and a little bit into my great-grandfather, but beyond that, nothing. But we can find out about our family, because this is our family, isn't it? All those saints of the Old Testament, aren't they our ancestors? Aren't they our ancestors? 
You say, oh, we're not Jewish like them. No, but God has taken us and he's grafted us in. We have been adopted as sons of this family, so we too. When I read about Nehemiah, he is an ancient member of my family. I want to know what my family have been up to. When I read through the other saints of the Old Testament, they are the family of God, but I too am the family of God. And I want to know my family's history. What is it that God has done through my family in the past? Sometimes we learn by the mistakes that they made. Do you know a wise person watches others make mistakes and doesn't make the same ones himself? That's wisdom. It's not wise to make the same mistake. That's stupidity. So wise people watch others, read about others' mistakes, and don't go there. Stay well away. But also we can learn from their tremendous, wonderful example. Those that God shows forth. He shows their mistakes, yes, for our benefit, but he also shows what a wonderful example they were in listening to God, worshipping God, hearing God. And we can learn from our ancestors the way that God wants us to live our lives. Let me read this passage then that we'll be looking at this morning. It's from Nehemiah. I'm going to read the whole of chapter 1. That's just about 11 verses or so. And then 8 verses of chapter 2. It gives a little bit of the setting of what I've said, but it focuses on a prayer. The first chapter, fairly short chapter, just focuses mainly on a prayer that he offers. And we'll see in the eight verses of the second chapter, there's another prayer that's involved. So right from the start, we see that Nehemiah is a man who prays. Now, what I mean by prayer is that he has conversation with God. He is in a relationship with God. He lives in the presence of God. He appreciates that God wants to hear what he has to say, and he wants to talk back to him. So we've got a prayer then in the first section and the second. Let me read this together to you. The word of Nehemiah, the son of Halkeelah. In the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hananiah, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The walls of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and I wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed because the God of heaven, then I said, O Lord God of heaven, the great awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and obey his commands, let your ears be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night. For your servants, the people of Israel, I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's house, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed the commands, the decrees, the laws you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instruction that you gave your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizons, I will gather them from where there and bring them to this place, I have, or the place that I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. They are your servants and your people whom you redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. I was cupbearer to the king. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, then Wine was brought for him. I took the wine and I gave it to the king, and I, had, and I had not been sad in his presence before. So the king asked me, 
Why does, his fa- why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. I was very much afraid. But I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my fathers are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? The king said to me, what is it that you want? Then I prayed to God of heaven. See, we see another sharp prayer there. And I answered the king, if it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in his sight, Let him send me to the city in Judah, where my fathers are buried, so that I can rebuild it. Then the king, with the queen sitting beside him, asked him, How long will your journey take, and when will you get back? It pleased the king to send me, so I set a time. I also said to him, he's getting a bit bold now, if it pleases the king, may I have letters to the governors of Trans-Euphrates so that they will provide me safe conduct until I arrive in Judah? And may I have a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, so that he will give me timber to make beams for the gates of the city by the temple and for the city wall and for the residences I will occupy? And because the gracious hand of my God was upon me, the king granted my request. That's the section we're just going to be looking at and considering, quite a small section of the whole book. Satan wants to convince you that the contribution that you make to the building up of the kingdom of God is insignificant. In fact, in the grand scheme of things, Your efforts are not really worth thinking about. That's what Satan would seek to convince every one of us. There are something like 7 billion people in the world. There are 2 billion Christians. What could I possibly do that could make any difference to the affairs of this world and the kingdom of God? That's what Satan wants to say to us. You're irrelevant. You don't count. You're not strong. You're not in an influential position. You probably haven't got sufficient funds to do anything. No, no. God works through small things, through insignificant things, things that don't appear to be anything, yet in the hands of God, they're part of the phenomenal work that God is doing. The New Testament teaches me that I am part of a royal priesthood. What does that mean? Well, that means I'm royal and I'm priestly. In the sight of God, that means I have authority. I'm royalty and I have a connection to God and to man because I am a priest unto my God. Well, God obviously thinks I'm relatively important in his economy. As I was looking through this, I thought, this is interesting. Ezra was a priest, and Nehemiah was a governor or a king. So we see in these two people the kingship and the priestlyhood brought together in one book, but only in one man. But we are all kings and priests unto our God. If there are truly two billion Christians in the world, there are two billion kings and priests in this world. If Christ lives in us, there are two billion people that have Christ dwelling in them. Isn't that exciting? You go, well, no, I just, no, you haven't convinced me. I'm still nothing and nobody. No one could ever use me. God wouldn't use me. No, maybe no one could ever use you. But God is looking for people like us who will dare to lay hold of the Word of God and say, God, I don't mind what I do as long as I do something. I need to have a part to play in the building of this kingdom. See, when I stand before the Lord, I want him to say, well done, my good and faithful servant Philip, because you... And then what is it he's going to put in there? I did the things that you called me to do. I'm going, to, I'm going to watch when, he, when Nehemiah comes before the Lord. And he says, Nehemiah, 
well done, my good and faithful servant, because you built me a wall. Oh, that's exciting, isn't it? He gets a book in the Bible because he builds a wall. See how important it is to God. Well, you say, oh, he did some other things. Well, I know he did, but basically God called him to build a wall. God has called you. You might be well into what you're called to do. I'm well into it. I better be because I haven't, I'm more at the end than I am at the beginning, so I better be well into it. But God has given us a job to do, a function to do, a part to play in the building up of this kingdom. You say, well, could it be in the realm of worship? Could it be in the realm of mercy ministry? Could it be in the realm of uh, sharing or looking after people? Whatever it is, there's a tremendous amount of work that God has called each one of us to. And we need to recognize that it is by his grace and his strength and his power that we do this. Ezra was then called to teach the people. Nehemiah was called to build a wall. I also see in this that he didn't just drop something on Nehemiah. Nehemiah wasn't just getting on with his life and he goes, oh, who can I have to build a wall around it? Oh, I'll, I'll use him. Nehemiah was prepared from his childhood it's as though he came into the world and God knew what he would use him for. And so God placed him in a particular family, gave him a particular education, brought him into certain relationships, taught him certain skills and abilities, and groomed him for the work that he wanted him to do. It isn't by accident. It's not an accident I stand before you this morning. God has fashioned and made it possible and developed us. If he did it for Nehemiah, he's doing it for you. Where you went to school, the family you were born into, the nation that you grew up in, the nation you find yourselves in now, that is an accident. That is the hand of God on your life directing you. As I thought about this, I thought, oh, Nehemiah was a bit like Moses. Moses lived in a foreign country. And yet the hand of God was clearly on Moses, raising him up to do what he wanted to do. Nehemiah never lived in Jerusalem, ever. He was in captivity all his life, life a bit like Moses, growing up in a foreign culture, a foreign nation. And yet God, we see, preparing both of these men for what he had for them to do. I'm the same as Nehemiah. So are you. You're the same as Moses. God has prepared you and made you ready, fashioned you that you might partner with Christ in the work that he's called you to do. In closing, what I want to do, well, I say in closing, when the pastor says it's in closing, it's never really in closing. It's getting towards the end or halfway through. Okay, so anyway, I want to say something about this man, what we glean from just these few scriptures about these men. Firstly, I'd say that Nehemiah was a passionate man. Are you passionate about God? If you're not, if you're a bit indifferent and lethargic, it's very hard to get God or for God to get you moving in what he wants you to do. He's almost got to wake you up and shake you up first and, and realize that you need to have a passion. I've discovered that what I have a passion about, I get into. No, it could be secular or it could be spiritual. I mean, I'm a Welshman, really, and so I have a passion for rugby, okay? And so I could really get into that. Well, I did for a long time, and then I found something far more interesting than rugby, and his name was Jesus. Now, I haven't lost totally my passion, but you understand, what you love, what you get into, you get very passionate about, and, and God has made us to be passionate, but we have to be passionate about the things of God, for God to then start moving through us in a wonderful way. This man was passionate about the things that God was passionate about. God was passionate about Jerusalem and the nation of Israel and building up the city. This man had never been there. And yet when he got reports of what a state it was in, it said that he wept, he fasted, he mourned, and he was prepared to risk his life. He was passionate about the things that God was passionate about. Do you know God is passionate about London? 
without a doubt, he's passionate about our nation. As a nation once, we were sending missionaries out all over the world. And God is passionate about our nation that he's bringing thousands of missionaries to this land. I was talking to a Korea pastor recently, and he said, you know, there are 400 Korean pastors in the UK. I thought, dear me, where are they all? And if there's 400 Korean ones, there's, there's all these other nations. There's Indian pastors and pastors from the States and pastors everywhere. God is passionate about this land. He's passionate about raising his, uh, his importance and his relevance again in our land. And we have to get passionate about it. I'm hoping that when this series is finished, you're going to say, there is a part I have to play in this, in this place, London, that God wants me to do something, whatever it is. And I will be passionate about it. He was a prayerful person. We saw there in the first chapter, most of the first chapter is a prayer. And then the second uh, chapter, we see another little prayer. The first prayer is thought out very carefully. It's as though he's crafted it. It's as though he's come and made petition first about his situation before God. He's reminded God of what a lovely God he is and how God listens to him. And then he brings the promises of God back to him and presents it to him. His, his prayer is, is fashioned and grafted. It's a wonderful prayer. But then when he's standing before the king, it says this. And the king said to me in chapter 2, what is it you want? He didn't expect that answer. Not for one minute. He thought maybe he would have to bring a presentation or write things down or whether the king would say, away from me. Then I pray to God in heaven. It's the, oh, God, what should I say? See, his prayer was, his response to everything was to make it upward to God. He knew where the strength came from. He knew where the direction came from. He knew where the life came from. So his, his prayer was always there, ready, on his lips to go, whether it was long and thought out or whether it was short. He was a resolute man. He was a determined man. He knew when he went into the presence of the king, the king could be in a real bad mood. I mean, it could have been off with his head. Remember when Joseph was in prison, the cupbearer there didn't end up in too good a place, did he? So it's a similar sort of thing, like, oh, I'll let the baker come back because I like his donuts, but the cupbearer, he gets it. So... So he was thinking, I do pray. And maybe he prayed, God, put the king in a good mood as I bring my presentation for him. It appears that God made him miserable. We don't think of God making people miserable, do we? See, his effort would have been to smile in front of the king. But he was miserable in front of the king. And so the king said, what is it? What is it that is troubling you? Now... In bringing his petition to the king, the king could have had, I thought, of three responses. Number one, he could have thought, what on earth are you thinking about your business when I pay you to think of my business? Get out of my presence. He could have thought, how ungrateful you are. You have this wonderful privileged position to be so close to me and you're thinking about your own affairs, your own people, your own nation. And then, because at the end, we see he makes all these demands to the king. He wants papers. He wants safe conduct. He wants the materials to build it all. He's on a roll now. He's bringing all this to the king. And the king could have said, what a cheek, or stronger words. How dare you make demands from me so you can build up your nation? But he, he was bold in the presence of the king. I find him to be an unselfish man. You know, some Christians, they are very committed to God in prayer while things are going hard. And then when things even out and they get a bit comfortable, they tend to rest a bit on their laurels. You know, they take it easy. They enjoy the blessing. This man was in a very comfortable position, a confidant to the king. He had everything. He lived in real comfort, a bit like Moses in a way. 
but he was unselfish. He thought of the Jewish people. He thought of God. He thought of the city of God. He thought about how it was broken down. And he wanted to get himself out of this comfortable place into a place where his life would start to count. I see he was an organized man. Because as soon as he went in front of the king, he had already worked out exactly what he wanted. I don't think he was expecting the king that day to say, what do you want? But when he said, what do you want? He had it all down there, didn't he? He had thought it all out. So he wasn't just a bricklayer. He had a bit more to him than that. A bit of a statesman. And then we see that he was a man of faith. Two things I want to draw out about this man of faith. He knew God... To be people of faith, you must know God. Can I say, and please listen clearly, we do not put faith in this book. We put our faith in what this book says, but our faith is in a person. You have faith in the person of God. To have faith, you must know what God is like. You must know the love of God, what's on the mind of God the purpose of God, the character of God. Your faith is not in a book. It's not even in a promise in a book. It's in a person. And the person who speaks the promises, we know that he's true. He says, he says to God, I know you are a God who keeps his covenant of love with those who obey you. See, he knew how much God loved him. He said, as long as I'm obedient to the covenant Your love is overwhelming to me. Can you say that? It doesn't matter what I do. It doesn't matter how I slip up God. My desire is to keep your covenant. And I know because my desire is to keep your covenant, you love me with an everlasting love that can never be diminished or broken down. Do you know your God loves you? Do you know he loves you? Because... To know he loves you, it's easier to come to him with requests. It's easier to have faith in what he says because you know the love of God. He says another thing, he says, I know you are a God who sees and hears his servant. God is listening and looking at you all of the time. You go, all of the time? When I go to bed, when I get up, when I wash, when I eat my food... He said, I will never leave you, and I will never forsake you. You can go to the very ends of the earth, and I will be there. My eyes will always be attentive, and my ears will always be listening. He's recorded every foolish word you've ever said, therefore he must be listening. Well, forget about that one. What about all the good things I've said? Yes, he's recorded all those too. Every time you've praised him and worshipped him and declared his goodness, he's heard it and heard it and heard it and heard it and heard it again. He's seen all that you've done. He's seen all the sacrifices you've made. He's seen when you give a cup of water to the least of one of these. He's seen everything. That's the God that we come to in faith. We must know our God. And he said, I know that you are a God who forgives when men repent. If God points out to you you've got got something wrong, change your mind quick. It isn't about crying and asking God to forgive you. That You can do all that and not repent. Repenting is turning away, changing your mind about what God thinks about things and embracing the way that God thinks. He knew his God, but then he brings to him a promise that he had read or knew about that Moses had written down. It's in chapter 1 and verse 8. If you are unfaithful, God said, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizons, I will gather them back from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. Seventy years after Christ, the nation of Israel was dispersed all over the world. And in 1948, God gathered them back to be a nation. There's probably not another nation in the world that could be dispersed for 2,000 years 
and gathered back. I would put it to you, you wouldn't even identify these people. But both the people of God and the church of Christ were praying for the people of God to return to their nation. God is faithful. It might take a long time for God to fulfill his promises, but God will do what God has said and nothing can stand in the way of that. Nehemiah then was a man of destiny. He was a man who was called to build a wall. God had prepared him for that period to do that thing. And he was faithful in what God had called him to do. Although he might not think he was the best wall builder in the world, he was prepared to do it. See, God wants to call each one of you for the work that he's called you to do. It might be clear to you what it is. You might know it might be a ministry amongst the poor, a ministry to the elderly, a ministry in, in secular schools. It might be a ministry in the church in some way, outside of the church, in the marketplace. It could be anywhere. But we're all called. We're all men and women of destiny. We're all kings and priests unto our God. Nehemiah is not that important and we're just nothings. We stand level with Nehemiah, with Moses, with the Apostle Paul, with Peter. We stand together as the builders of the kingdom of God. I want to pray with you this morning. I want to pray that this year, if you don't know what your mission is, if you don't know what the call of God on your life is, that you will know clearly what it is. And that because it's the call of God, you will be more than committed to dedicate yourself to it. If you know what it is, then what you need is more grace and more power and more virtue because it is not by might, but it is by the Spirit of God that the kingdom of God is built. I stand here not because I'm smart, not because I'm a really well-educated person, not because I, I stand here by the grace and the power of God and I'm dependent on it constantly. Yes, we do the homework. We do what we have to do, but at the end of the day, it is God's anointing that gets the work done. And you might never stand on a pulpit, but there's a million other things to do. Imagine if we all stood on pulpits. The whole kingdom would just be hot air. It would just be words and sounds, but it's not. Of course, I only get to stand here now and again. All the rest of the time, I have to be busy myself building up the kingdom of God in whatever God has given me to do. If you would like prayer this morning to know and discover what your grace and gifting is for this year, I'd invite you to come to the front. If you know what the grace and gifting in your life is, you just stand and we'll pray generally for you. So let's do those two things. If you want to discover what God's grace and gifting is for you for 2018, you come to the front so you can be prayed for. There's others here that will come and pray for you. You come. But if you know what the call is on your life, what God has asked you to do, you stand just where you are and we'll pray for an increased blessing to come upon your life. It is by the Spirit of God that you accomplish the things of God. It is not by might nor by power, but by his spirit. So if you want to know what the call of God is on your life, you come forward. People will pray for you. I'm not saying God will speak to you and tell you today. But if you ask God, he says, listen, ask of me and I will tell you what it is. I will give it to you. You will know what it is you're meant to be doing. And then you can give yourself wholeheartedly to that. If you know what it is, just stand where you are and we'll pray for you there. Pastor, you need to sort this out for me because this is...